This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And this week's case takes us to Waldport, Oregon. Walport's located in Lincoln County and has a total land area of 3.2 square miles and a population of around 2,000. It's located on the Alsea River, which flows 48 and a half miles to the Pacific Ocean. And the case this week centers around the Longo family. The head of the Longo family is Christian Longo, who was born in Michigan. He was a product of a split family. His mother divorced his father when he was four years old and married a man named Joe Longo. And Christian took on his stepfather's last name. He had been Catholic, but converted to Jehovah's Witness when Christian was very young. He was homeschooled during high school. He met and married Mary Jane Barker, who was also born in Michigan and also raised in a strict Jehovah's Witness household. Christian was active in church from a young age and participated in door-to-door ministries and Christian and Mary Jane had attended the same Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses, which is what the worship building or church is called. When they got engaged, Christian bought Mary a three and a half carat diamond ring. On March 13th, 1993, Mary Jane and Christian were married. Mary Jane was 25 at the time and Christian was 19. When Christian was 22 years old, he got a job working at a company that distributed the New York Times. And within a few years, Christian rose through the ranks and became the manager of that company. Christian eventually left this job and launched his own construction subcontracting business called Final Touch. And what Final Touch did is they were basically a cleaning company for contractors. Between 1997 and 1999, the Longo family grew even more with the addition of three children, Zachary, Sadie, and Madison. Business was good. Family life was good. The Longos were able to take many vacations, had lots of nice things, and were always driving brand new cars. This thriving business also allowed Mary Jane to be a stay-at-home mom. Originally, they had been from Michigan. They were from Ypsilanti, Michigan, but had recently moved to Waldport, Oregon. The case began on December 19, 2001. A body was found floating in a marina on the Alsea River near Waldport, Oregon. The Lincoln County Sheriff's Department had no idea the identity of this body, except they knew it was a child. So they put out a picture of this child to the local media to see if anybody could identify him. A woman named Denise Thompson came forward. She said she had been the babysitter for this child and identified him as four-year-old Zachary Longo. She said she knew the family because she worked at Starbucks with Zachary's father, Christian Longo. After Zachary was found, divers began to search the water in the area, and three days later, they find another body of a child. This child had been weighted down underwater. Denise Thompson is able to also identify this child, and it was three-year-old Sadie Longo. They found Sadie's body on the same day that Denise came forward and identified Zachary. On December 27th, divers found two suitcases in the water just outside where the Longo family had been living. One suitcase contained the body of their youngest child, two-year-old Madison. The other suitcase contained the body of Mary Jane Longo. The police continued to search the water with divers looking for Christian Longo, but there were no other bodies found. A funeral was held for the family with Mary Jane and Madison buried in the same coffin and no Christian Longo. So it should be pretty obvious to everybody by this point that Christian Longo is a suspect in these crimes and Denise Thompson is a very important witness. Maybe she didn't witness the crimes, but she's a very important part of the case. And police 
drill her for even more information, and she's able to provide it. She said that on the day that Zachary's body was found, she had talked with Christian. He told Denise that she wouldn't be seeing the rest of the family anymore because he and Mary Jane were getting divorced. In addition to speaking with Denise, police are able to obtain surveillance video a few days prior to Zachary being found, and it showed the Longos all shopping together as a family. They had recently moved into the upscale housing complex with an apartment overlooking the water. Denise told police that she was surprised because she thought the couple seemed very happy with one another. So police also speak with Mary Jane's sister, Penny, and Penny tells them that Christian is a very charming person, that he was the kind of husband the other women were jealous of. Penny said that Christian and Mary Jane seemed to be doing well financially when he owned his own business, and she assumed that they were probably heavily in debt now or might have been getting help from Christian's parents. She said that Christian was very hung up on his image. It was very important to him, and he wanted to look good. But further investigation reveals that everything isn't what it seems. The Longos experienced financial difficulty throughout their marriage. When they got engaged, Christian had bought Mary Jane that very expensive three and a half carat engagement ring on a payment plan. One month, he didn't have enough to make the payment, so he stole $108 from his employer. Those employees were questioned at the business, but Longo didn't speak up. But the next day, he left a check for the $108 along with a resignation letter. He also did not pay his rent that month. At the time, he was living with roommates who were also Jehovah's Witness members. So these roommates go and tell the elders of Jehovah's Witness what Longo had done. And Longo gets sanctioned and lost some of his responsibilities in the congregation. Now, Mary Jane supported him through this. But because of his sanctions, they were unable to get married in the Kingdom Hall. By this point, Christian had run up $25,000 in credit card debt, and this was before their first child was ever even born. Police find more information about Christian's construction subcontracting business. He had started it with another Jehovah's Witness member, and business had taken off and did very well. But he tried to expand too quickly and in no time was drowning in debt. But Longo didn't act that way because he continued to spend. The debt became so overwhelming that he set up a fake address to reroute the bills and notices from debt collectors. But he went even further. He wrote checks to himself from clients who had not authorized him to write these checks in an amount totaling nearly $30,000. Now, these were obviously counterfeit checks, and he had made the checks on his own computer. He had written seven counterfeit checks, with each constituting a felony. So he was looking at some prison time. His credit cards were all maxed out, but he told his father that business was doing very well, and even convinced his father to invest tens of thousands of dollars in the business. Soon, Christian had a boat, two jet skis, and two cars. He told some friends that he had won a contest to get these things. But during that time, his Ford Taurus was repossessed. Like he told his father, he told Mary Jane and everyone else that business was great. But he was in over his head, and the debt kept piling. Christian eventually gets caught making these counterfeit checks, and he's going to have to answer for it. And Mary Jane's not happy, but he tells Mary Jane that he's done with this way of life. He would not commit any crimes ever again. But Mary Jane found an email between Christian and another woman and suspected Christian was having an affair. On May 26th of 2000, Mary Jane called her younger sister Sally upset about Christian's affair. Mary Jane said Christian told her he did not love her anymore because she devoted too much of her attention to the children and she was no longer any fun after the kids were born. Mary Jane was terribly upset because she didn't want her kids to grow up without their father. She loved Christian and, and just wanted to work things out. 
In September of 2000, this is when Christian goes to court on those checks. In court, he explains that he was just a man who was financially in trouble and and was really just trying to take care of his family. He got a light sentence, probation and paying restitution. But because he's image conscious, he overinflated his income to the court. So the restitution payments were much larger than he could pay. Because of Christian's criminal actions, he was kicked out of Jehovah's Witness. After being kicked out of Jehovah's Witness and the argument with Mary Jane about another woman, Christian tells Mary Jane he wants a fresh start and a new life for them. But Christian had not stopped. Remember the Ford Taurus that was repossessed? They still had another car, but when it broke down, Christian got a fake driver's license and went to test drive a Pontiac Montana van but he didn't return it. Mary Jane asked Christian why there were no billing statements coming in on the new van, but he said, oh, it's probably just some kind of clerical error, and soon the bills started to arrive. What had happened, Christian had made fake ones on his computer and mailed them to their home. Christian promised Mary Jane with this new life they were going to straighten out their finances, but they both deserve one last present. So Mary Jane got corrective eye surgery and Christian got scuba lessons. Longo had also gotten credit cards in his father's name without his father's knowledge and ran those up to $100,000. So in 2001, for this fresh start, the family packs up their belongings and relocates to Ohio. But in order to get money to move, Christian sold Mary Jane's expensive wedding ring. This new home Christian had gotten for them was a warehouse in Toledo, Ohio. Now, the warehouse was not set up for somebody to live there, but they moved into it anyway. Christian said he was going to renovate it into this loft-style home. The warehouse currently, though, did not have kitchen facilities or adequate plumbing. He told Mary Jane that he went ahead and paid the rent for six months. But in actuality, Longo was cashing more counterfeit and forged checks. During this time, Mary Jane's sister Sally couldn't get in touch with her. And she knew they were living in a warehouse in Toledo, Ohio. So Sally actually went there driving around looking for where they could be living. And she found them. And the way she found them was she saw their dog outside of the warehouse. She talked to Mary Jane, and Mary Jane said, I'm perfectly fine, and I'm not going to leave my husband. So Sally goes back to Michigan. Now, with them moving from Michigan to Ohio, this causes Christian to be charged with probation violation because he has left the state. Also, while in Toledo, Christian had sold stolen construction equipment, and the police were catching on. So two months after their move to Ohio, an arrest warrant was issued in Michigan for the probation violation. And here come those new charges for stolen construction equipment. So the police go to the warehouse, but it was abandoned. And a lot of the Longo property was still there. It looked like they left in a hurry. What Christian was doing was leaving before he could be arrested. The family loaded up a moving truck, and they loaded up their stolen van and headed out of Ohio. Mary Jane's cell phone had been cut off, and her family was still unable to reach her. Mary Jane's sister became concerned and filed a missing persons report. But in early November of 2001, Mary Jane sent a postcard to her sister Sally, and the postcard was postmarked from South Dakota. Mary Jane told Sally she no longer had her phone, but would be in touch with her soon. So police close out this missing persons case on Mary Jane. But both of her sisters still felt that something just wasn't right. The family ended up moving to Oregon around September of 2001. And Christian Longo needs a job. But the only job he could get was at Starbucks making $7.40 an hour working part-time to support his family. And ever the smooth talker that Christian Longo was, he got the job at Starbucks by explaining to the manager that he was rich. He made his money during the internet boom and he did not need money and he did not need to work. 
But he wanted to work, and he wanted to work at Starbucks because he liked having something to do, and he loved coffee. They started staying at the Newport Motor Inn around the 1st of November. Christian told the manager there he had come from Portland and was there to help set up a new Starbucks. But by the end of November, Christian Longo was able to talk his way into an expensive apartment that he could in no way afford. He told the manager he was a subcontractor for Quest and was sent to survey the coast for DSL lines. And he was able to convince this manager that he was waiting on his paycheck. And they were allowed to move into this apartment that cost $1,500 a month with no money down. He told the manager he only had two kids and his family actually lived out of town, but they might come visit on some weekends. What Christian was really doing was gas drive off so he'd pull up to the pump pump his gas and leave without paying just to keep gas in the family van on december 9th of 2001 the longo family went to look at a green dodge durango at a dealership in wilsonville and only 10 days later is when zachary's body was found police discover another little tip that about a month before the family was found dead Christian Longo had written down the credit card number of a Starbucks customer. Obviously, I mean, we don't even need to say that he was living beyond his means at all stages of his life. Christian can't be found, but the police highly suspect and they have enough evidence that they think that Christian Longo is the one that did this. So December 28th of 2001, Christian Longo was charged with aggravated murder. That same day, federal arrest warrants were issued in the U.S. District Court of Oregon for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Christian Longo was added to the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives. So we know that Longo is going to be a slippery character and probably working into some manipulative storyline on down the way to try to rebuild his life. But it catches up with him in January of 2002. He's arrested by the FBI and Mexican authorities at a campground near Tulum, Mexico. Two Canadian citizens had been vacationing in Mexico, and when they returned home, they see the FBI's top 10 most wanted list, and they recognized a face, and that was the face of Christian Longo. The problem was is they recognized the face of Christian Longo, but they didn't know him that way. They knew the man as Michael Finkel, a well-known travel writer who had written for the New York Times. This man had told stories of his travels, and they said that Michael Finkel was very convincing. If he wasn't actually Michael Finkel, he was a great actor or con man. And Finkel had told these two Canadian citizens that he was on assignment working on Mayan mysticism and would be visiting ruins in the area. Working on these Mayan mysticism and visiting the ruins, Finkel would need a photographer, and he put the word out that he needed one. And a young German woman named Yania Frank was staying at the same place as Finkel and wanted to be his photographer. And quickly it turned into more than that. It became romantic. What Longo didn't know, or Finkel, depending on who you are, was that the FBI was tracing the purchases on stolen credit card numbers from Oregon Starbucks. And on January 13th, 2002, Agent Clegg of the FBI, who was assigned to the office in Mexico City, received information that they had gotten a hit, that Christian Longo was at a campground near Tulum in the state of Quintana Roo. So as police close in on Longo, he spends his last few minutes of freedom smoking marijuana with his new love interest, who thinks that he's Michael Finkel. Because he was, in fact, pretending to be Michael Finkel. He had spent two and a half weeks on the run in Mexico. He was immediately arrested on January 13th and returned to the U.S. He didn't try to fight extradition or anything back like that. He went back voluntarily. While returning to the U.S., he was asked by FBI agent Clegg about the murders, and Longo replied, I sent them to a better place. Now, why would Christian Longo say he is this travel writer for the New York Times named Michael Finkel? 
Well, if you remember, Longo had worked for a distributor of the New York Times and became manager. And he would frequently read the articles written by Michael Finkel, and he enjoyed them. He had this dream of being a world traveler like him. Michael Finkel was a prize-winning feature writer for the New York Times. Finkel had a home in Bozeman, Montana, and his girlfriend Jill had even moved from Alabama to be with him. But Jill said that Finkel was a little over-involved in his career and not involved in the other parts of his life. So she ended up leaving that relationship because she said he was intoxicated with all the attention of being Michael Finkel. He wanted more, and he wanted to outdo everyone. Now, at the time that Longo was pretending to be Finkel, Finkel was coming to disgrace in journalism. Finkel had written a story on child slavery in West Africa, but he actually fabricated parts of the story. He created a character comprised of stories from several different people and made this one imaginary person. When his bosses found out, he was fired. So Finkel retreated back to his home in Montana, and he received a call from a reporter. And he thought the call was about his writing and his disgrace, but this reporter wanted to know if he knew about the man pretending to be him. And this was the first time that Finkel heard the name Christian Lago. But he wanted to know who this man was and why he chose to pretend to be him. Once Longo is arrested after pretending to be Michael Finkel, Longo and Finkel end up meeting in person. They began to write letters, and Longo would write these long handwritten letters to Finkel. They had weekly recorded phone calls and had over 50 conversations. Longo promised to tell Finkel the true story of the murders and said he was not guilty of killing his family. Finkel said Longo had an explanation for everything and presented himself as a good man just struggling to try to live the American dream. Longo just wanted more than anything to be successful and do it all by himself and not need help and not rely on anyone. He explained that writing the counterfeit checks was to keep his business above water for the benefit of his family. Longo never actually revealed the truth to Finkel although they kept a long-time friendship. Well, obviously, after taking Longo into custody, he's going to be interviewed by police, and he, in fact, was on three separate occasions. Longo suggested that the crimes took place in the early morning hours of Monday, December 17th, although he didn't say for sure. He stated that he got off work at about 11 p.m., and he said it was Sunday or Monday, and he couldn't clearly remember which day. Now, his work record showed that he had worked both Sunday and Monday until 11 p.m., so they weren't able to confirm or deny which day it was based on that. He said that everyone was asleep when he got home from work, and so he had some wine and cheese and just kind of relaxed. He was sitting on his deck pondering his financial troubles and then went to bed and laid down with Mary Jane. He said that Madison was sleeping on the floor on a comforter and Zachary and Sadie were sleeping on the couch in the living room. He said he laid in bed awake for a couple of hours. He didn't further describe his crimes and there were certain aspects of the crime that he would not discuss, period. He told the FBI that his looks and speaking skills had helped him get away with most of his cons and crimes, but he just wouldn't speak directly in detail about the murders of his family. So Christian Longo was indicted on seven counts of aggravated murder. And I know some people out there may be wondering, seven, he didn't kill seven people, but it kind of has to do with semantics and how you're charged based on what the law says. The first four counts was one murder charge for each of his four victims. And that was aggravated murder because there was more than one person murdered during each incident. That's the caveat that makes it aggravated murder. The other three counts bringing the total to seven were because three of the victims were under the age of 14. So you see this a lot when people are charged with murders and they've killed multiple people. They've got all the, each state has their own thing that, ups the number of charges, even though there were actually only four people killed. Early 2003, the trial began. 
The defense began their statements with a huge shock. Longo had killed his wife and youngest child, Madison. Longo pled guilty to counts 1, 4, and 7, which was one charge for Mary Jane and the two charges for Madison, and he did so without any kind of plea deal. He refused to enter pleas on the other four counts for Zachary and Sadie, so the court entered not guilty for him. The prosecution, their motive was that Longo didn't like being tied down with a wife and kids. They said he took steps weeks and even months before he killed his family to prepare to be a single man. He had begun to isolate Mary Jane from her family, cutting off the phone, no contact with them. There was evidence on his computer from the website Hitman Online, and this site can give advice on ways to murder people. Six weeks before he murdered his entire family, he used the last of his frequent flyer miles to fly from Portland, Oregon to South Dakota. And remember, Mary Jane's sister had received a postcard from Mary Jane postmarked South Dakota. In his work locker, police found pages printed from internet obituaries of four young adult men that were in that area. Handwritten on three of these were social security numbers of these men. When Longo was arrested, he had the names also in his possession, and that was potentially to get fake identities. In the warehouse in Ohio, they found Mary Jane's wedding dress and two books of significance, one of Spanish phrases and one called the Modern Identity Changer. As far as the timeline, we know Longo did not work on December 15th. Denise Thompson babysat that night for the Longos, and Christian and Mary Jane went to a movie. They got home around 10.30 p.m. This is the last time that anyone saw Mary Jane and the kids. The police believe that Longo killed his family on December 16th of 2001. At about 2 a.m. on December 16th, the couple directly above the Longos heard dragging noises for about 5 to 15 minutes, and they said it was pretty loud. The female neighbor thought it was coming from beneath them, and her husband thought it was coming from next door, so they called both condos and no one answered. The next morning, they complained to the front desk about the noises and were told that neither of the rooms beside them had occupants, so that meant it had to be beneath them. And that is where the Longos lived. The prosecution also had a witness, Dick Hodge. He was a truck driver who was driving on Highway 34 around 4.30 a.m. on December 17th when he came across a red minivan stopped in the middle of the bridge. He offered to help the man in the van, but he declined. The man said his check engine light had come on, but it had gone off now and he was fine. On the afternoon of Tuesday, December 18th, a green Dodge Durango was stolen from town and country car dealership and a maroon minivan was left in its place with a plate removed. Underneath where the plate was located, it showed the impression of the tag that had been on the vehicle, and it said, Kid Van. The Kid Van plate had been registered to another vehicle that had belonged to Longo. He couldn't register it to the van because that van was stolen, and he leaves the stolen van and steals a Durango. Inside the van were two other plates. On that same day that the Durango was stolen, Longo attended a work Christmas party driving a green Dodge Durango. They did a gift exchange with their co-workers, and he gave a bottle of Mary Jane's perfume as a gift, and it was not a new bottle of perfume. On Tuesday, December 18th, an employee at the Newport Motor Inn found discarded children's clothing, baby books, and a wallet with Mary Jane's driver's license in their dumpster. On that same afternoon, Longo spoke with the condo manager and said he had taken his wife and kids to the airport, and also he and Mary Jane were having problems. On Wednesday, December 19th, Longo worked from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m., that is the day he told Denise and other co-workers Mary Jane had been having an affair and she had left him for another man. He told Denise that he wasn't even sure if Madison was his child. He told her that he had just put the minivan in storage 
He talked about his new Durango and how he was going to install a CD player in it. And he made plans with Denise and her husband for Saturday to go buy a CD player so Denise's husband could install it. But he didn't make it that Saturday because he was already out of town by then. This same day, he rented a movie. This was the day Zachary's body was found. On Thursday, December 20th, Longo worked from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. and later played volleyball with a co-worker. It was on Friday, December 21st, that Denise identified Zachary's body. This same day, Longo drove the stolen Durango to San Francisco. He gets to San Francisco and actually applied for a job at the Starbucks there. On December 26th, he bought a plane ticket to Mexico with that stolen credit card number that he had stolen a month before from a Starbucks customer. He left the Durango in the parking lot of the San Francisco International Airport. Inside the Durango, police found the plate that read Kid Van, along with Longo's checkbook, marriage license, and diploma. Police and prosecution theorized he killed his family on December 16th, and it was three days later that Zachary was found. They feel like the pressure had mounted. The rent on that expensive condo was going to be due and he knew that he would have to tell Mary Jane and they would have to move again. But from the trial, we learn more on the deaths of the Longo family and get some of the details. Zachary, the four-year-old, had a pillowcase filled with rocks tied to his legs and he was in his underwear. Somehow, this pillowcase of rocks had come loose and he floated to the surface in the icy water and was found. Sadie, the three-year-old who was found beneath the water, had a child's pillowcase twisted shut containing a large rock and tied to her leg, and she was in her underwear. They were dropped off the bridge on Highway 43 near Waldport, the same bridge where that truck driver had seen a red van stopped. And it was near this same bridge that Zachary's body was found. 34-year-old Mary Jane had been stuffed into the suitcase along with dumbbells, and some strands of her hair was caught between the zipper and the exterior of the suitcase, and she was naked. There was evidence of blunt force trauma to her face. Two-year-old Madison had been put into the suitcase with dumbbells and packed with clothing items. The suitcases had been dumped off the dock at a marina. The autopsy showed Mary Jane and Madison had been strangled, but they could not exactly determine how the other two children had died. The medical examiner said Zachary and Sadie had died of asphyxiation, but he could not be more specific. The prosecution theorized that Sadie and Zachary were sleeping when Longo put them into the minivan and drove to the bridge. He possibly tossed them in while they were still alive after he tied the cases with rocks to their legs, or he asphyxiated them and then tied the cases with rocks and threw them off the bridge. The prosecution said Longo was so arrogant that he truly believed no one would even notice his family was missing and they would believe his stories. At trial, Longo also admitted to events that he had told police in those three interviews, but he denied that the murders took place on December 16th or 17th. He said that they actually occurred on Tuesday, December the 18th. He said that the family had come to visit him at work on the 17th, but the security tapes from that date had already been taped over, so they were unable to confirm that. He said that he came home late one night from work and felt absolutely defeated. He had wine and cheese and had an all-night conversation where he told Mary Jane all the lies he had been hiding and that she lost it. She told him she no longer wanted anything to do with him and started to berate him for 45 minutes. He said that she was more emotional than he had ever seen and even slapped him at one point. He fell asleep on the couch and was later awoken by Zachary, who asked him to check on Mary Jane. And he does that and finds that Mary Jane is sick. Seeing that his wife was sick, he asked her, you know, hey, let me stay home from work to help you. And, and she didn't want to do that. This was on December 17th. She said that the last thing they needed to do was to stay at home from work because they needed the money. And she yelled at him about it. She drove him to work that day, and he kissed the kids goodbye. Now, remember, this is all according to his testimony. That night, Mary Jane picked him up from work, but didn't have the kids with her. 
She was only wearing her bathrobe and no shoes. He asked about the kids, but she wouldn't speak to him all the way home. He states that when they got to the home, she began to whimper and he had to help her inside. And once inside, she slumped on the floor. As this is happening, he sees Madison's lifeless body on the bed and the two other children missing. He says that Mary Jane started just acting crazy. She was curled into a ball on the floor and was bouncing back and forth, hitting her head and back against the wall. And Christian began shaking Mary Jane to try to get an answer for, from her regarding you know, what's going on with the kids. And she responded with, you did this. You killed us. And she said the other kids were in the water. Christian said he lost control at this point and grabbed her with both hands around her neck and squeezed and then dropped her. He picked her up and repositioned his hands and squeezed her until he was unable to hold her up any longer. Again, this is all his testimony. Obviously, we're seeing this tactics a common thing in criminal cases. He's trying to lessen how bad he looks. He then claims that he got two suitcases to put Mary Jane and Madison in, and when he realized Madison was still breathing, he had no choice but to put his hands on her throat and squeeze. He said that he strangled Madison because she was breathing but unresponsive, and that he felt she was suffering and he wanted to put her out of her misery. He said that even though she was breathing, he thought of her as dead, and at that point he attempted to smother her, and then when he stopped, he saw her breathing again. And that's when he actually choked her. He said the suitcase for Madison was too big for her small body, so he filled it with her clothes to make it more comfortable for her. He implied that Mary Jane had dumped Zachary and Sadie off of a bridge near where they were found, and that wasn't him that committed that crime. The defense pointed out that Mary Jane and Madison were killed and disposed of differently than Zachary and Sadie. The prosecution pointed out that Mary Jane had no history of violence and was only 110 pounds, and this story just wasn't plausible. It took the jury a little over four hours to return with their verdict on April 7, 2003, guilty on all four counts of murder that he had not already pled guilty to. So during the sentencing phase, Christian Longo said he was starting to feel remorse and empathy that he had not felt before. In a 2005 phone interview with 48 Hours, he talked about killing Madison. He said he just was not as close with Madison as he was with his other two children. And he said something just kicked in. In months after the trial, he had conversations with Mary Jane's sister, Sally, and letters with Finkel. And Christian hinted at a full confession and some details about the murders of Zachary and Sadie. But when he began working on his appeal, he denied this and went back to his original story. He said that he had intended to turn himself in, but he was caught before he could do so. While he was in jail and before he was found guilty, he wrote an 82-line poem to a woman who was also in jail. This letter poem began, Dear Senorita Cotton Candy, and it went on to say, Okay, Lady of Sweet Puffiness, You've overwhelmed and awed me. You've drawn me close and sent me reeling. He said in this letter he wanted to make sweet love to her under the stars. Well, Senorita Cotton Candy snitched on him. And she was able to get out of some drug charges she was facing. Now, this letter allowed police to get a warrant for Longo's phone and some other items. And the guard seized handwritten documents containing details of the murders of Mary Jane and Madison. He was writing down his story for trial. So this cotton candy letter, as it was called, was admissible for sentencing only. And it was showing how this man who says he's remorseful is sending these flirty yet creepy letters to another woman in jail while facing seven counts of murder. Also during the trial, he broke through two panes of glass in his cell and hid the shards of glass under his bed. They also found screws and string. His defense attorney said he was making the holes in the window to get a better view through the frosted glass. The prosecution said there were two other people involved in this with Longo, and it was a plot to help him escape. One of these other men had also been in jail. He said Longo had asked him to return to the jail after he was released, and Longo actually gave him clothing and Mexican pesos to do so. 
Longo wanted this released inmate to pass saw blades and rope through the hole in the window. This sentence hearing did not go so well for Christian Longo. On April 16th of 2004, he was sentenced to death. But Oregon currently has a moratorium on death sentences. In 2011, Christian finally admits that he's the one who killed the entire family, and he's sitting in jail on death row when this happens. This same time, he files a request to marry one of his female pen pals. Longo also campaigned to allow executed inmates to donate their organs for transplant, which had been rejected by the state of Oregon and prison officials. On March 5, 2011, an article was published in the New York Times titled Giving Life After Death Row, and the author was Christian Longo. It starts with, eight years ago, I was sentenced to death for the murders of my wife and three children. I'm guilty. I once thought I could fool others into believing this was not true. He also said that he asked to end his remaining appeals and wanted, and wanted to donate his organs after execution. Longo still sits on death row and is currently 48 years old. And in another weird twist, in 2008, Mary Jane's sister discovered that a volunteer with the Lincoln County District Attorney's Office who worked in the Victim Advocate Program had stolen her identity and opened three cell phone accounts and a satellite TV account. Michael Finkel went on to write the book True Story, Murder, Memoir, Mea Culpa, which was made into a film in 2015. So tell me the similarities that we see here for the discussion of Chris Watts. My wife did it, and I became so enraged that I killed my wife, but then I hid my entire family. I think that's just a reflexive thing. What else are you going to say when your whole family gets found dead and you're the only one still alive? I mean, I don't know what I don't know how else you would would say it. if you're not going to outright confess, you're going to put it on the other adult involved. Yeah, but his explanation, I mean, why would you even explain it that way? I mean, we know that he killed his family, but to say, well, Madison was lifeless, but she started breathing, and I choked her to put her out of her misery. I mean, that. why would you even explain it that way? Well, because in his mind, I mean, he, he thinks he's a good person. or Well, he wants to portray this image of being a good person, and it's something that in law enforcement we see a lot. Well, the... People, when confronted with the truth, will do anything to lessen the harshness of it or even the way it sounds. So even at a subconscious level, he's hoping to score some brownie points with jury members because I saved my daughter a excruciating death with a much faster one in his twisted mind sounds better. I mean, I guess so. That would... <laughs> that would help explain somewhat, but the difference that I see in what we examine with Chris Watts and with Christian Longo is Christian Longo was a lifelong master manipulator. And you see these people who think that they can, they can explain their way out of anything. I mean, some people know they can't and they'll just say, no, no, I'm not going to talk to you or they'll just shut down. He's one of those that... I can talk my way out of this. I'm smarter than everybody else here, and they're going to believe me. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, it just catches up with them. I mean, and this happens to these manipulators and con men. I mean, eventually they push too far, and that seems to be what it doesn't seem like he was to me, and this is just my opinion and take on it. I mean, the true con men are good at getting away with stuff. He wasn't very good. It just took a long time for him to get caught. I'm speaking in regards to his financial crimes more so than his homicides, although he only made it on the run two weeks on the homicides, which, you know. Well, he made it almost a month. But still, that's not very good, right? I mean, people go years. Uh, what was that, John List or whatever? What was oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he kills his family, he starts a whole other life, moves cross country. I mean, his whole family has no idea that he. So, you know, by comparison, this guy didn't do real well. I don't think this guy was near as smart as he thought he was. I don't think he was as good a con man as he thought he was. And he certainly 
wasn't as good a murderer as he thought he was, and, for the record, don't want any of his organs donated to me. Well, that's what I was going to get to next. I think with his manipulation that he has been showing all his life and how he wants to look good and this image is everything, I have a feeling, I could be wrong because I don't know exactly what's going on in somebody's head, but my feeling is this was to make him look good. I'm trying to 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 make up for killing my family and I want to advocate for people to be able to donate their organs look at me i'm doing good and then i have a subscription the new york times and i have published a link to that article if you want to read it i just read the first part to be able to tell y'all what it said but i mean i I think it i think it's part of his game well yeah and i mean it also is an attempt to stay relevant right and the fact that the new york times even publishes an article from a convicted murderer. Like, I don't know. I have issues with that too. That's probably wandering off towards my opinion, my salty opinion. But again, I think it's just another an attempt to stay relevant because who keeps up with anybody on Oregon's death row? I mean, who cares? The guy's going to sit there till he's executed or he dies a natural death. He knows that. And people like this, have a hard time with that. I mean, they got to have this this thrill, this attention. Like you said, this, let me show you how good I am. So now he's gotten, <laughs> from death row, he's gotten an article published in the New York Times. Guy's a scumbag. They probably ought not publish him, I think. Well, it was an opinion piece. and Like this? Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's the New York Times. Like I said, I have a subscription, so I read the New York Times. But I, I, like I said, I think it's still part of his con. Um, I don't think we have anything else this week. No, we hope you enjoyed this week's case. And as always, we'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com. Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one. And Twitter at TC Out Loud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com.